you all have uh, Dr. Joshua Walker's uh, biography in front of you, so I won't go into all the details of that, um, but he is a transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund here in DC as well. He's a professor at George Mason University. This year, however, he's been teaching all over the country. Since the first time I've met him, he's been everywhere. He's a globe trotter and uh, very busy, but he um, has a lot of experience with uh, transatlantic issues as well as Turkey. Um, and the EU, so he's going to be talking about uh, immigration issues in Germany this morning. So thank you very much. I always like talking to high school teachers because the first thing you think when you look at me is say, you look like you should be one of my students. It's not possible that you have those degrees. I assure you my students at college have the same reaction. Um, as Amanda said, I'm not an expert on Germany at all. Uh, I'm a turkey expert, and that's why I travel so much. Turkey's exploded in a lot of different ways in the last couple years. But it's directly relevant to what you're learning about today, and I'm glad that my, my friend and colleague Peter is coming in next because he's uh, the man when it comes to Eurozone crisis, when it comes to economic issues. I'm more of a geopolitical guy myself. Um, what I want to do is kind of talk a little bit about uh, the role that Germany has played, will play, uh, and the importance of kind of uh, the immigration question for not only Germany but Europe in general because uh, if you read the newspapers and you kind of go to Europe, there are a lot of things that you'll pick up on. Uh, since 9-11 in this country there's been similar questions that I'm sure your students in the different places you come from uh, struggle with as well in terms of the role of Islam, how does that play in a person's personal life, what is their ethnic origin, what is their uh, homeland, their grandparents, the immigration question, how does it interact. And you know, in the field of international relations, political science and history, we all take different approaches to these things. Luckily, uh, I, I tend to be very egalitarian and try to take the best of in many different ways. So what I'd like to do uh, is kind of offer a historical perspective. You know, you guys have gone from the evolution of Germany, you've looked at what happened after World War II. I think if you're going to look at the question of immigration in Germany and you're going to look at particularly the biggest group of immigrants that have come to Germany uh, that are not, uh, for lack of a better term, white or, or, or the same kind of Christian stock as, uh, as you will, uh, they come from Turkey. Uh, and the relationship between the Turks and the Germans is a long one and it's a difficult one as well. Uh, most people begin the story of Turkish immigration with the guest worker program, which began in the 1960s, right after the construction of the Berlin Wall in 1961, the, the idea being, well, up until that point in time, there was a lot of need, and, and, and as the German economy began to take off, they were looking for immigrants, much like the United States, uh, kind of inviting people to come here. Germany had a very different history, but in the same way said, look, we have an economic uh, imperative to have immigration. Uh, and for the majority of German history, that had always come from the East. And so whether it was the Poles or whether it was Russians or other groups or other German uh, groups that, for a lot of different reasons, wars, migration, found their way back to the quote-unquote homeland. Uh, the Turkish story is very different. The Turkish story, you have to go before 1961. In many ways, I would argue that the Turkish story uh, began with the Ottoman Empire. And I think this big question of kind of history and political science is something that it's hard to separate because as a political scientist, I only look at nations that have been created in the, the last 20th century. But it's impossible to separate the history of an empire that becomes a republic. And that's certainly the case of the Ottoman Empire. It's certainly the case of Germany as well. Uh, so even though you might want to date it from a certain period, uh, you need to look before that. I would actually date uh, the kind of the major interaction, kind of the very first uh, kind of interaction between Germans and Turks as being 1683. Uh, that's the year at which the Turks made it to the gates of Vienna uh, and were finally repelled. It was the last time that the Turks made it as far as they did uh, right up uh, to Vienna, right uh, into the, the heart of what would become the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, and the Turks were repelled. And from that point onward, uh, the Ottoman Empire did not have a very good set of history, from 1683 all the way till its demise in 1918, series of defeat after defeat after defeat. Uh, and the reason the Germans are important in this is for the very moment the Ottoman Empire was declining, the German Empire was beginning to expand. It was becoming much bigger. Now, of course, if you think about it from a historical perspective, you have the new empires versus the latecomers. And the latecomer empires would be like the Germans, the Japanese, these types, as opposed to the British and the French that had kind of gone around the world and kind of painted their uh, flag on all sorts of different places. Think about the scramble in Africa. Think about Latin America. Think about what was happen happening in Asia as the demise of the Chinese Empire. Think about what was happening in Iran with the Russians and the British competing. The Germans were trying to find space around the world. And one of the easiest places they could find space in many ways were places that were crumbling, that were falling apart. And so even the Ottoman Empire, and even though some of the late sultans had a you know, a personal affinity uh, to French or British ways of doing things, uh, the French and the British were not very excited about partnering with the Ottomans. You know, a very famous uh, British prime minister who at the time was, a, was an undersecretary of the Navy, uh, Winston Churchill, uh, once purportedly said, 
the, the Turks are not worth allies because they actually cost more than they give. And he made this argument about World War I and said, we don't want to be a part of this empire and work with them in World War I. So as a result, even though the Ottoman Empire tried very desperately to be on the side of the British, uh, in many ways when the Russians joined on the side of the British, that was the end uh, of that opportunity. Because every time the Russians are on one side of history, the Turks tend to be on the other side. And so here comes Germany with all the different things you know in terms of World War I. The Ottoman Empire joins with them. It becomes a major focal point because when you look in the Turkish educational system, when you look at their kind of different legal construction, which comes from the Swiss and the French system, uh, the Germans were very influential. When you looked at kind of the history of World War I and the founding of the Republic, uh, kind of Germany in many ways was the most important player. And kind of the dirty secret here in terms of uh, Turkey and Germany is during World War II, even though they were a belligerent non-neutral, meaning they were a neutral country that tried to make themselves prickly on both sides so that if Hitler tried to invade or if the Allies tried to invade, they would make themselves so costly no one would do it, uh, they actually leaned towards uh, the Nazi side. Um, if you look at a lot of the, the newspapers, I was actually at a conference yesterday at UPenn, and this guy did an entire history of this, and you see these, these headlines from 1930s and 40s. It was very clear that the Turks thought the Germans were going to win, and they were like, well, this time around, we want to be on the right side of history. Last time we lost with the Germans, this time they're going to win. Let's be on the right side. And you have these pictures of Hitler and uh, the president at the time, Isma Inonu. They look identical. They have the exact same mustache. I would argue in some ways that the founding of the Turkish Republic with Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was not uh, kind of a democratic movement of any sort. It was more of a benevolent dictatorship. Uh, and as a result, there was this affinity in a lot of ways. And it wasn't until the very last days of World War II uh, that the Turks joined on the Allied side because they wanted to be founding members of the United Nations. And so that history from the very beginning in many ways permeates and makes, you, it, makes it, it kind of it, it explains it beyond just simply the economic factor. Because if it was just immigration for economic factors, uh, there are a lot of other places that would make sense. And you know in immigration, uh, whether it's in France or Britain, there tends to be this kind of imperial kind of drainage. So in other words, if you're a former colony like India or Nigeria uh, or you're from Cameroon or from Morocco, you end up going to kind of the former empires in many ways because that's an easier linkage because as, uh, as a colonial power, you have certain rights in those home countries. Whereas Germany did not have these same kind of colonial domains, so as a result, it became a lot more natural to look for the Mediterranean. So you first had uh, mass uh, immigration from a lot of areas in the Mediterranean. Turkey was one of the largest ones. Now, the important part here also is not just what's happening in Germany at the time. I already described it in 1961. Uh, you have the Berlin Wall that basically shuts off all immigration from the east. It has to come now from more or less the free world, um, or the third world, as it were. Uh, the other issue is what's happening in Turkey. You know, Turkey had gone through a major series of crises uh, leading up to World War II and after World War II. There was a sense of stability, meaning they joined the right side of history, meaning they joined the United States and, and the Western allies. They were in Korea. They were NATO allies. Uh, and, and so they, they had chosen the West. But in many ways, the, the military's role in Turkey had taken a particular turn so that basically you had a coup in 1960. And so in 1961, when the Berlin Wall is constructed and then there's a call for guest workers from Germany, there's a real imperative for everyone who's been affected negatively negatively by this military coup, and it was uh, permeated the entire structure, there would be a way in which they could find a natural hub. And so you had a large uh, transfer of people from the very eastern part of Turkey. They also tended to be, be predominantly non-educated. These were not high-skilled labor workers that were coming in. These were basically people that even in the Turkish context had a hard time finding jobs. And so they began to pour into Germany. And from 1960, 1970, 1980, there was a large influx. And you know, today, if you look at the numbers, it depends on how you count it, right? There's a difference between being a German citizen who, of Turkish origin and being a Turkish ethnic uh, origin. So there's over 1.5 million uh, citizens of Turkey that have a German passport as well, so these kind of dual nationals or, or anything else. There's close to 4 million that have ethnic Turkish links uh, in Germany today. So you can imagine the numbers basically spiked in the 1960s, 70s, and onward. Um, and th this came uh, during a period of time in which obviously uh, given that the German uh, economy was doing so well, it was very simple to kind of say, okay, well, these people would live in these types of areas. And because of economic uh, imperative, just like in the United States, you would have certain areas of the cities that would be kind of predominantly African-American or predominantly Hispanic, and these were the low-income areas. The same things began to happen. So instead of ghettos uh, being Jewish like they used to be or being ghettos in this country because of urban development, they began to become primarily immigrant and particularly Turkish-focused. Uh, and what's interesting about this is if anybody's been to Berlin or or any other parts of Germany, there are entire villages that you can, there are entire areas of cities you can go to, and I don't speak German very well, but I speak Turkish fluently. I don't have to use German when I go to Germany most of the time. I can speak Turkish the entire time. And the way I feel when I walk through the streets of these areas 
is very much what, what Turkey looked like when I you know, first started studying Turkey 10 years ago. And it probably is what it used to be like in the 1980s. It is certainly not the Turkey that I know today. And so there's been an amazing disconnect between the immigrants that have gone and kind of established this life. And what's interesting is there's a real divide within the immigration community, within the Turkish community in Germany, with those that have had kept a very strong leak to, uh, to Turkey, meaning every time one of their children was going to get married, they would send them back to Turkey to kind of find a wife or to find a husband or whatever else it may be and bring them with them. And this was the big issue because in the 60s and 70s, a lot of men came to work in the factories and came to do these jobs and they sometimes would leave their families. But then it became a much more popular thing to take the entire family with them. So after a couple of years of sending money back to Anatolia, back to Turkey, saying we're going to bring our entire families over. We want our kids to be educated in the German system. They'll have a better life if they do this. And so you have this, this next generation of children who speak fluent German, are completely integrated within the German system, and yet they're not treated as equals in the German educational system or even in the political process. Um, there has been major change in the last couple of years that people who are experts on Germany can talk a lot more about. But from my understanding, uh, up until a couple of years ago, if you were, like I was describing, a dual citizen and you didn't actually go through the proper procedures in terms of uh, being registered and also having your homeland uh, being German, even if you'd never been to Turkey, you were not given the rights to vote. You had to be kind of, you know, you had to kind of choose one or the other. Uh, that's beginning to change, and, and the kind of the idea of what it means to be a German citizen itself has evolved over time. You know, the German system of, of kind of citizenship is much more akin to what I'm familiar with, where I grew up in Japan, where despite the fact I lived there for 17 years, my brother was born in Japan, I will never be Japanese because of the way I look. My mother's not Japanese. There's no blood lineage in me. Uh, and so it's not like the American or Canadian or other system where if you're born in this country or if you spend a certain amount of time and you apply, you can become American. And I always joke with my friends that I actually, in many ways, am less American than many of my friends who have accents or don't look, quote unquote, like an American like I do. Uh, they're actually far more American than I am. Uh, and that's something that's, that's changing in Germany, but it, we're not quite there yet. And I think, in general, uh, this major difference in terms of immigration policy that the United States has versus most of continental Europe. Um, you know, Britain is different in a lot of ways, but continental Europe certainly has struggled mightily with this. And, you know, there, there's always been these subsequent waves of immigration. I think you can follow this through the history of the European. Union as well. When you think about which countries joined the EU, uh, you know, let's take away the British as a special case for the time being, but you had the Irish that came in as kind of, this is a first group of immigrants, that they were different than us. Now we're going to go to the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Greeks, they're all different than us. Then we come into the Poles and the Ukrainians, these type of things. And then at the very end of that spectrum, or the Muslims, right, the Turks and the Moroccans and North Africans. And then there's a distinction being made today that you have a distinction being made of which, which groups are good and bad. Uh, and you have this kind of ongoing discussion within countries like France and Austria, less so in Germany because German ten Germany tends to be a lot more politically correct, but you're beginning to see uh, the kind of the rise of right-wing parties in all parts of continental Europe that use the immigration question as a major kind of block in the same way that, say, the Tea Party here uses the immigration question of kind of, well, Hispanics are taking over all of our jobs, they're coming in, and there's this kind of racist tint underneath if you scratch the surface of these things. You find the same types of things in Europe, and the Turks have found themselves right in the middle of this. And what's interesting about it it is uh, back in the 1960s and 70s, yes, they were Muslim, but at the end of the day, they were good Muslims because they were on our side. They were not communists. And so at the end of the day, it would almost be better to employ the Turks than it would be to employ other groups of countries that were on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. And so in many ways, uh, they had a privileged position, even though they might not have been European. But the question of where Turkey fit in terms of being Western was not questioned. Of course, it was on our side. But after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and kind of the re reunification of Germany, there became this new imperative of saying, okay, well, look, we're, we're integrating with the West Germany that has a large Turkish immigration population with East Germany that doesn't have that. The East, East Germans, uh, in many ways, were also economic migrants, and you had a large flow from other parts of uh, the Eastern world saying, look, Germany is probably our best bet for an economic success in, in kind of the Eastern uh, European world. And Germany, in many ways, became that magnet. It became the engine, as it always had been from the European Union, European integration process. And so thinking about uh, what that leads us to today is a fascinating question, because you've had over 20-something years now um, <clears throat> between uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and where we are today. And yet some of the questions remain the same. You know, some of the, the, the issues that I constantly deal with whenever I deal with immigration in Germany about Turks goes back to kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, very Orientalist thinking of, you know, why can't these people assimilate? Why can't these people be like us? And, you know, it's not all that different than some of the debates we have in this country about <clears throat> how can we be respectful of someone else's culture 
religion, their traditions, but at the same time expect them to give of themselves to this country. Because if you're always kind of constantly looking back to the homeland as being your real kind of home, then how can you ever be a kind of a true citizen? But I think in many ways this is changing because the concept of global citizen, the concept of what it means to be European is changing. And the fact that Turkey's been on the process of European Union membership for the last 40 years also puts it in a different place. Because assuming if we take the rhetoric at, at the official level at, for face value, which I'm skeptical because of some of the problems that exist out there. Um, you would assume that in 15 to 20 years, Turkey will be part of the European Union, and this will, in many ways, change the dynamics completely. And I think the big question that many people have now is, look, we've seen what history shows in terms of the trend lines, <clears throat> in terms of the number of Turkish immigrants that come in. Is this going to continue? Now, I would argue you can't look at it simplistically like that because the world has changed so dramatically and that the Turkish economy, which used to be abysmal and used to be in direct need of kind of European Union assistance and needed help, is actually in a totally different position. Turkey last quarter was the fastest growing economy in the world. In many ways, if, you know, I make jokes all the time with my European Union minister friends who all have this great little pin that has like the Turkish Republic, which has this big crescent with a star here, and the, Tur the European Union, which is basically a bunch of stars in a circle. They have, they, they've put the two together. It looks like the Turkish Crescent's Pac-Man about to eat the European Union. And the irony of this, of course, would not have been, you know, wouldn't have been funny like 10 years ago because there'd be nothing to laugh about. But given the crisis that we're seeing in Greece and Italy and kind of the falling down of kind of the euro from being one of the strongest economic zones in the world to being the one that looks like it's the most likely to fall, Turkey is kind of sitting there on the outside quite smugly saying, you know, we're actually kind of happy we're not part of the European Union right now. You know, you're going to be coming back to us and not talking to us kind of as down kind of immigrants. You're going to be coming to us with your hands out saying we need help. And when you think about demographically, the, the trend in Europe, uh, for, for Western Europe in particular, the trends are not pretty. Um, you know, the, the number of kids that are being born and, and to families in France uh, and other places, Germany is one of the few that's flatlined precisely because of immigrants, right? Whereas other places in, in, other, in other parts of Europe, it, it's, a, it's a very abysmal story. And when you look at the inverse of this in, in the Middle East, which Turkey is a part of, you know, 70% of the population is below the age of 30, whereas I think the inverse is true in the other cases, right? You know, 70% are above the age of 30 uh, in most European places. Uh, it would seem that there's a nice synergy here. And, you know, perhaps it's because I grew up in Japan uh, and I have an Asian perspective on things, but when you look at the Middle East and Europe from a Chinese or a Japanese or even Indian perspective, they look a lot more similar than they look apart. Like the idea that Islam and Judaism and Christianity are these hugely different and dividing f things, looked at from a Hindu perspective, from a Buddhist perspective, from a Shinto perspective, you all believe in one God. You all came from the same Abrahamic traditions. You all basically share the same Old Testament in many ways. How can you not get along? It, it, it's a fascinating dynamic. And when you think about kind of the world in which the direction we're going in terms of the rise of kind of the East versus the West, and you've seen the president of this country traveling overseas and giving a lot of importance to Asia, it seems very clear that uh, Europeans, Americans, and uh, those in the Middle East, both Turks, Arabs, and Persians, and Kurds, I would argue, and Israelis as well, uh, have a lot more in common, have a lot more that they need to be working on together if they're going to continue on, on a path of being a constructive uh, civilizational discussions than uh, what's happening right now. And it, it's, you know, it, I, I tend to be an optimist, and maybe that's a, a fault of mine, but I tend to think that perhaps in moments of weakness, so whether it's the European Union crisis that we're looking right now, or America's kind of look for a place for its own global leadership as we withdraw from Iraq and also trying to figure out new ways to reorient our transatlantic relations, this is actually an opportunity in many ways to think of the fact that, you know, we can't do this on our own. Who are our natural partners? And in many ways, <clears throat> Germany is best placed to be that natural partner. Germany is in the position as the, the largest and the strongest economy in Europe to actually offer some hope. Because if I were to look at kind of the different European economies, the place that I would say has the greatest potential in the next kind of 10 to 20 years and even the next you know, 21st century moving forward, it's Germany. Uh, and, but the only way Germany can continue on that path is if it's kind of immigration policy continues and you continue to have immigrants that are assimilating. And some of the, the discussion that's happened recently where the Turkish Prime Minister went to Germany and basically gave a major speech to a group of immigrants of Turkish origin and said, you know, you are first and foremost Turks. That is your, that is your prerogative. You are Turks first, work for us, and then work for everybody else. It's particularly unhelpful. Uh, it, you know, it, it's the same as if you had some African leader coming here and doing the same thing, having an Asian leader, Chinese American community, et cetera. Um, it's particularly unhelpful, and it, it, it stokes the fires and the flames and the fears of many, uh, you know, citizens of that country that have been there, and you know, may have 
may, may have an incentive to work with Turks if they see them as being on the, on the same side. But if they see these dividing barriers and they say, look, these guys have been here for 40 years and this grandmother, this grandfather doesn't speak my language, you know, how can we possibly have a conversation? And when you continue to have these pockets or these ghettos in, in German cities, it's only natural that if I'm a German citizen that looks like me and walks past the street, I'm going to feel uncomfortable. You know, just in the same way that if I live in a certain area of downtown Richmond where I'm from, you know, as a white male, I feel, you know, I don't feel as safe in certain areas because no one looks like me. You know, in many ways, this comes down to being able to have people-to-people -people relations and being able to have that discussion. And the other thing I'd say is this. Sometimes it's so simple to kind of dichotomize these fields and say, well, you know, it's the Turks versus the Germans. It's actually not that simple because the Turks of Germany are not like the Turks of Istanbul, right? These are the Turks that left 40 years ago. Like I said, they didn't have an education. They have not been a part of kind of the economic boom in Turkey. They've been the, the economic boom in Germany that may have helped them, you know, I increase their cost of living, but they were not a part of it culturally. So their kind of traditions, their kind of understanding have stayed almost as if ossified in the 1960s. And it hasn't evolved over time in the same way it has in Turkey. Now, there are exceptions to that rule, obviously. And the more exchange that happens back and forth, the better it is. And so they can, in many ways, be the very best of Turkey in terms of being global ambassadors for Turkey and to be able to show what it means to be a truly uh, global citizen, someone who, who loves their home in terms of Germany and, and wants to do things uh, that's right, uh, but also has a kind of a special connection. I mean, when you look at somebody like the, the, the leader of the Green Party, Yosha Fischer's former party, Cem Özdemir, this is a Turkish origin German who is at the very top of the political game. And many people think in the next election, he will be one of the kingmakers. You know, he's been called the Obama of Germany because of the fact he comes from <clears throat> minority background or immigration background. And so having someone like that on the national scene who's out there talking about the issues, and he's talking about the issues as a German. He's not talking about the issues as a Turk. You know, I just met with him three weeks ago when I was in Turkey, and it was fascinating to me. We're speaking to each other in Turkish, and yet he didn't reflect any of the normal views that I'm used to hearing from my Turkish counterparts. And he clearly is German. Like, he was more German than most Germans that I've met in terms of his views on things. And so even myself, as someone who I like to think is being open and understanding of things, was having a hard time kind of reorienting my mind of saying, I'm speaking in Turkish to this guy, but we got to talk about German, you know, nuclear policy and what this means in the wake of Fukushima and everything else. And so I think that it's natural that if we have that type of struggle at that level, what it's like working its way down. And I think the rise of someone like this uh, in the German political system is only going to help uh, kind of continue moving forward. You know, the last thing that I will say before opening it up, because I always like kind of interacting a lot more than anything else, is, you know, the future of Europe right now looks particularly bleak. Uh, and the question of, is Europe even going to be a global actor, is, is really being questioned today. And when you think about what um, kind of European embassies and what uh, Europeans are telling us, you know, there, there's this feeling of, look, we don't need to be number one. You know, we, we know that our time has passed in the sense that you know, we had our empires, we had our moment and days in the sun. And you know, America, as a natural prodigy of this, the kind of being the superpower that it is, is in many ways heading towards the same direction as we are. And so whether it means that uh, you know, Europe is not going to have a global role or not really depends on whether they can work together. Um, and if you've looked at international affairs over the last year, it doesn't look very promising. The fact that on the beginning of the Arab Spring there was no unified policy, uh, the fact that uh, the European Union you know, has created this kind of president and also this high representative of a foreign minister with Lady Ashton that don't really seem to be taken very seriously by anybody. It's still much more the prime minister of Britain, the prime minister, the president of France, the, the chancellor of Germany that are far more important in many ways. And I think in many ways these big countries, particularly Germany, uh, that have always had an incentive to bring the European Union closer together and bring these countries together are seeing that in the world that there's, a, there's an ability to play a duality here of being able to say we, we act together with the EU, but in particular moments to step outside. You know, Germany, the fact that it voted against the, the Libya, you know, it abstained and decided to stay out of the Libya vote when France and Britain took the lead on this was, was amazing. And it was in many ways a humiliation for a lot of Europeans to say, look, even on our biggest foreign policy operations, there was no EU flag there. It was all being done in the name of national interests. Um, and I think you see that struggle playing out today as well in Syria. Um, and when it comes to Iran, it's an even bigger question. You know, the big three, meaning Britain, Germany, and France, have always taken a much larger lead. Uh, and there have always been those that have said, look, we have our own particular interest here. We, you know, economically speaking, want to find ways of getting around whatever sanctions or whatever else we do. And in this case, you know, the, 
in many ways, countries like Turkey, and not just Turkey, Russia and others, are able to play Europeans off of each other. It's kind of like when you have your parents and you do something wrong and you get in trouble with your dad, you go quickly to your mom to try to get out of it or vice versa, uh, to be able to play one off of the other. Uh, and you know, in many ways, foreign policies become like that for the European Union, and it becomes even worse when you include the Americans to it. So when it comes to NATO, uh, it becomes very difficult for the Americans to try to find a way to balance all these different interests at a very moment in which we are kind of bogged down in wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and potentially new interventions whether it's in Libya or Syria or anywhere else. And so it's particularly incumbent on, on, uh, on both U.S. policymakers and also European policymakers to say, okay, well, what can we actually work on? What, what is our common interest here? And here I think immigration is a policy in an area in which there is a natural interest here, right? Um, I think, it, you know, if you think about the way societies are formed, I like to use Tony Blair's kind of, you know, ideas on this. He talks about the difference between open and closed societies. He doesn't talk about it in terms of being democratic or autocratic in the way we did during the Cold War. Even a lot of people in this country talk about He says, look, it's about being open or closed. And an open society is one that welcomes immigrants, that assimilates and lets them kind of be a part of it and gives them kind of buy-in to the societies they're becoming a part of. It gives them a social contract that allows them to move up and be a part of it. Uh, closed societies are ones that say, look, you may economically benefit, but you're never going to have your own voice here. And so uh, whether it's the Chinese system or whether it's the Russian system, um, I think with the power in many ways of what Germany represents within the European Union and what Europe represents in a global sense of being kind of the most important soft power out there. In other words, it's not going to be the largest military power. It may have the largest market, but it's never going to operate in the same way that one single economy can. Uh, the ability that it has is to be able to say, look, looking at our history, looking at the place that we've come from, here are the tools, here are the ways we can move forward, and here are the ways that we can kind of, uh, you know, dialogue with one another. And finding a way to kind of use the immigrants in Turkey, uh, in Germany, who are of Turkish origin, and the fact that Germany is unique in the sense that in many other places, whether it's Holland or France or Austria, other places, there are these large immigrant populations from a lot of different countries. In Germany, they're almost exclusively from Turkey, right? So you have a major opportunity here. If you're able to work with this group, and they are the predominant, the largest majority minority, it gives you an opportunity to dialogue and come together. Whereas in other places, it becomes very difficult because you have to deal with every particular kind of minority group and every different factional uh, you know, leaders that exist there. Uh, in, in Germany, that actually is not the case, and there is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, but at the very moment in which that need is the highest, uh, there have been political movements and others that have made it particularly difficult. So polarization is not something that's just uh, in this town. It's becoming increasingly evident everywhere around the world. Uh, when you think about you know, Chancellor Merkel and the difficulty she has in terms of balancing all these competing factions, uh, this issue is one that will continue to come up. And it's not it, and it's not unrelated to Turkey's accession to EU, because one of the biggest questions about Turkey's accession to the EU is, what does this mean for us? You know, if Europe wants to be a Christian club, Turkey's involvement as a Muslim-majority nation uh, does not allow uh, that to continue, and it also means that you have to come up with a new identity for Europe. Uh, because if Europe is going to be based on Judeo-Christian values and it's going to be based on kind of this very narrowly conceived geographic uh, distinction, uh, and particularly in a moment in which Europe is looking towards itself more and more and it's becoming more kind of isolationist and more of a fortress Europe, it makes it very difficult for countries like Turkey. And what's interesting is it's not just Turkey that matters here. It's the entire Middle East and particularly the Muslim world that is watching what's happening to Turkey, the way Turkey is being treated by countries like Germany, by countries in the European Union in that accession process and saying, look, if Europe can't even deal with Turkey and the Turks are the most Western of all the Easterners that we know, you know, how are they going to treat us? And clearly, if their prejudices are against the Turks, when many times Turks look just like we do uh, in terms of being "quote unquote" white, even though you mean, even though Europeans may not think so, uh, you know, how are they going to deal with people who completely look different, who have much darker complexion, have you know a different uh, you know way of wearing clothes and, 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 and beards or whatever else it may be? So I mean, I think this question is not just a simple one of kind of immigration and good or bad. This is a much larger existential question for the European Union, and it certainly is being driven in many ways by Germany. And you know, Germany has always had a different style of leading, you know, the, the charge of America leading from behind might have been invented by the Germans in my mind and the way that they've done things in the, the 20th and 21st century in the sense that they've always been a lot more quiet than their French counterparts who like to kind of show their imperial ambitions and run around the world. The Germans are a lot more quiet when it comes to these things. And so if there are uh, potentials for, for, for kind of reconciliation and ways of working together, uh, in my mind, it's going to come from Germany. And some of the best thinkers I know uh, come from Germany, but ironically, they don't actually come from the German parliament. They come from the European parliament who are German 
uh, MPs. Uh, and some of, the good, the, some of the best thinking I know of about these questions are happening in the European Parliament because that's where they have the freedom to kind of think beyond and think as Europeans and not just in their national interests, you know, German versus French, et cetera. So I think that these are the types of things that I would kind of put on the table and just kind of offer uh, to you uh, from the perspective that I sit and the types of work I do on these different questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.